thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Stephen Fraley. I'm the proud editor of Dear Dave magazine. Um, and I also just I just want to thank uh, Brian and everyone here at CLAM for hosting this wonderful event. Um, this magazine has been published since 2007. It comes out three times a year. And um, I was just really thrilled to be able to publish this Curtis, Curtis's new work and to somehow convince you to uh, contribute some thoughts about oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, part of my job here is to formally introduce these gentlemen, so please um, allow me to uh, go to my notes. Um, large print, as you can see. Uh, Hugh Ryan is a writer whose recent book, The Women's House of Detention, A Queer History, received a 2023 Stonewall Book Award from the American Library Association. His writing has recently appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Review, Harper's Bazaar, and Slate. Ryan has received the 2016 Martin Duberman Fellowship at the New York Public Library and several New York Foundation for the Arts grants in nonfiction literature. And when Brooklyn Was Queer was a New York, Time, New York Times editor's choice in 2019. Um, that's only the tip of the iceberg. It's way more accomplishment. We'll be here too late. Uh, Curtis Taylor, this young fellow, uh, to my right, is represented by Clamp Gallery in New York. His editorial photographs have appeared in Architectural Digest, House and Garden, New York Times, and on the cover of books by Knopf, Random House, Viking Penguin, and Harper Collins. A publication of his work, Rescuing Eden, Preserving American's Historic Gardens, was released by Monticelli in 2015. He has lectured at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and George Eastman House, and was a distinguished faculty member at the School of Visual Arts from 1981 to 2019. Uh, without any delay, I'd like to introduce these gentlemen. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in a copy of the magazine, yes. they, I, I always forget this. That they are it's your job. I know. <laughs> this, is, this is my weakness. The magazine is available for sale, and we have plenty of copies here for you, as well as the previous issue. So, again, without any further delay. Thank you, Stephen. But before we start, I would, I would like a, a shout out about Dear Dave in general. It is a wonderful periodical. And, you know, uh, there are, I've, st I'm going to diss some things. I stopped my Aperture um, uh, subscription because I found it so pretentious. Um, and uh, this, I probably, it's probably the editor was here and I've just insulted <laughs> somebody. But um, this is, frankly, Stephen's quirky way of seeing the world of photography and the world of art. And he throws together remarkable things. Yeah. And, and, you, and if you like everything in it, then there's something wrong with you. You know, you're going to hate one thing and love two things, and it's just, it's, it's terrific that way. And this issue is very much the same. Yeah, and it's also a lovely object, which as someone who subscribes to a lot of literary journals, um, often you get these journals filled with beautiful and amazing things, but the, the object itself is so ugly, you find it hard to like look at it, you know, and appreciate what's inside it. And this is actually like a work of beauty in and of itself. Yep. So I highly recommend picking yep. up a copy. Um, or, or a subscription is even better. Mm. Mm. I've had them for years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, I and I, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming tonight. And like you said, to Clamp for having me, for Curtis, uh, Stephen, for, for kicking off this whole thing and making it possible. Uh, we're not going to talk for too long, because I think the focus should be on the work that we're here for tonight. But before we even get into that work, I want to mention some of Curtis's other work. Because if you don't know his work, you might not know that we're going to be talking about these uh, sort of Victoriana portraits that he's been doing that are really beautiful. Um, and very historically based. But he was also one of the top garden photographers in America for many years. I find his garden photography to be lush and moving, emotional. There's movement in it. It always feels like the, the flowers are opening, the mists are rising. Uh, but my favorite of your work, honestly, is the underwater nude series that he did for many years, uh, which are beautiful. They, they capture, again, so much motion. 
Uh, so I just highly recommend that, yeah, we're going to talk about one section of his work tonight, but there is so much more out there. And really avail yourself. Look him up when you leave here tonight if you are not familiar with the other Go to the website. Go to Brian the website. is going to be re unveiling the Underwater News series in the not-too-distant future. <laughs> um, they were all hand-painted and done a very long time ago when I could still hold my breath and go underwater <laughs> um, and not bop to the top. Um, so those are going to be coming out, and they're... I, I can't wait to ah, see that. I, I really can't wait. They're, they're totally beautiful. And they're much bigger. Yes, yes. <laughs> These are the works that we're going to be talking about tonight, but we also have some of them. Uh, on, we're playing on the screen, so you might have seen them earlier. I feel like it's a, a perfect moment to be discussing these pieces in Clamp because we have these photos by George Platt Lines and these photos by Pajama and many other pieces that feel like they speak to the world of what Curtis is doing. Um, but before we even get there, let's start with... How did you start this series? Where, where did this particular brand of your work well, come from? I think, as you pointed out in the article, I think is that it was my studio. I found this studio in Union Square that just, I lucked into it with a huge skylight. And I walked, and I, I was working on this book and the other garden books, and I had to actually buy one of those, those things to, 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 to put it all in shade because it was so bright in there, I couldn't edit on a computer. And I thought, this is a waste of light. This is ridiculous. So I finally, when those books were finished, I put the computer away and brought out the camera and, and out the, the building was built in 19, around 1908. So kind of more, I suppose, Edwardian light, but I guess, anyway, but it's huge skylights and anybody who walked in it, that room just looked great. <laughs> you know? And I said, okay, I, Victoriana, and I always had a thing about it. Mm -hmm. um, that's too long a story to get into, but it's just, uh, when I was first doing photography, the picture there of the young lady was taken in 1974 when we were in college. And that's what all young ladies look like in college in 1974. <laughs> um, and um, it was pre-Raphaelite. And I kind of had a, and I lived with a woman at that point who was, the whole house was done in Morris prints like this. <laughs> and, um, and so anyway, it's always just been an, an aesthetic that, that I've been drawn to, so I decided because of people, and we'll get into these pictures in a second, um, a few photographers who I had books about and I knew about um, that I would attempt to go there. Um, and to recreate to a degree um, what the aesthetics were of the time. Because I had the light. <laughs> I had that. And then I had to do everything else. Um, so it started with that. So let's talk about the aesthetics of the time and what it is that, that you are referencing. Studios. Because you've got some images for us and some folks to discuss. Right. So I'm going to step away for a second so you can yep. control the computer. Yep. No, you I'm the... not doing it. They're doing oh, it back. I thought you needed to. This is like, this is so high tech. I just say, next. <laughs> That's the that next. That's yeah. next. <laughs> oh, this isn't supposed to be here. OK, this is what happens. OK, doesn't matter. Um, but then that's not, that was a studio back then, right? This is my studio now. This picture can't be more than six months old. Um, and it's a much smaller studio than that one you just saw in the previous image. But um, I put this in there because, um, well, there's the Morris. There it is. There's your shirt. <laughs> um, and so I've reproduced that. Next, please. This is a, a taken in France, um, an Impressionist painter. I can't remember which one, um, in his studio in 1880 or something. Next, please. And this, <laughs> this is Mr. Eakins <laughs> in his studio. <laughs> I've never taken a picture like this. You'll be glad to know. But uh, <laughs> here he is playing his flute, <laughs> as it were, uh, in, his in his studio with his stone age chair and you know, who knows what else. Um, I just had to put it in. Next. And here's Mr. Eakins. Um, you know, he did, he did photographs in preparation for his paintings. Um, and this is one of his most famous photographs. Next. And here we get to a man named F. Holland Day, um, who was an American eccentric of the first order. Um, this is a picture of himself as Jesus Christ. He starved himself and went up on a cross and was sort of semi-crucified. Um, when this was shown in England at a huge thing, it was a big deal. He was vilified. He was run out. Of, he, his whole career collapsed. He was the number one photographer in the world at the time. 
and he thought his career was over. The show was supposed to go to France next, and he couldn't stop it. And he went to France and it was a cause celeb. Everybody <laughs> loved him. So it, the complete reverse happened in France. They welcomed as the great artist. Um, but this is pretty wacky. Next, please. Here he is. Um, an aesthetic. Uh, his, his father was a, he had lots of money. His father had patent medicines. The money was made. Next, please. So this we're getting to the aesthetics. This is these are all his photographs. Um, he he printed all in platinum prints. Next, <clears throat> this um, I want to we discussed in your article representations of, of uh, black Americans, um, and he was considered by many at the time. It probably would be argued now that he didn't that he gave them a certain amount of pride, um, and I thought, oh, he's put feathers on him. It's, you know, but I looked in other pictures, and there's a picture of a young white man wearing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So he just thought it was something cool to wear. But this, by the way, was his manservant. Um, so he had a built-in model, as it were. And John Singer Sargent also painted his manservant, as did Winslow Homer paint his manservant. Kind of interesting. And anyway, next, please. <clears throat> this is beautiful and I think does speak to what I spoke to before. I think this is a beautiful representation of, 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 of a person. It doesn't matter what they're, but that's, and that again is his manservant. He's a brilliant photographer. Next. So here we go. This is a, a sanotype, which is what the blue ones are. Um, and we'll get to them later. And this is a process. They're blue. I tend to turn them brown just because blue can be difficult. <laughs> um, but this is the pictorial type of, I won't go into long history of photography, but pictorial look, which is photography was too accurate and people weren't buying into it. And so, so photographers thought, let's make it look more like, like paintings. So the pictorialists came along and gave this soft focus. Next. Um, this is one of his models who, um, I, I, there's wonderful letters from the model hitting him up for money. Yeah. Um, we had a wonderful day together. I had such a wonderful time in the woods with you that day. Send me money. Anyway, next. This is wild. I don't know if I could reproduce that. Isn't that extraordinary? Um, it's, you talked about in one of the pictures, the fairy lights. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is nothing but fairy lights. Next. This is one of mine. So I'm trying to show you the influence um, that, that he had on what, what, I, what I do. Next. And of course, St. Sebastian. Every gay photographer or painter has to do St. Sebastian for some crazy reason. <laughs> this is his version. Next. This is my version. Sam was here with me that day, weren't you, Sam? Sam was my art director. Yes. <laughs> um, next, please. Um, and this is Imogene Cunningham in 1903, her husband. And this is, she chose to go soft, but not as soft as he did, and stay black and white, because this is going into the black and white period. And these are all pictures of her husband, which I think is really, really charming and wonderful. Next. Isn't, oh. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next. This is me. This is the one you're talking about. The yeah, fairy light. He calls these the fairy lights. Mm -hmm. This was our, our garden in Stanford. <laughs> All right, next. And this is another one of hers, of her husband. Next. Here we have Mr. Van Gloden, uh, Baron Van Gloden, who um, photographed um, in Italy. It was a rather famous character. Queen, um, Queen uh, Victoria bought his work. It was very, because he couched it in history. But you'll note there is a, a print there that's, mm -hmm. that is a, he's not necessarily doing anything ethnic. Next, please. Back then, to make the pictures work, you had to reference mythology of some kind. Greek, preferably. <laughs> um, but he found these young men and put them in, I didn't do a lot of this, you usually put them in sandals and togas, and it gets a little corny. Next. <clears throat> uh, or he would just do this. <laughs> um, but um, he's not doing that Greek thing here. That's why I put it in. This is a little more like, OK, this is more of its time. Next. 
That's it. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you a little background, so we can we can we can talk now. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I I'm really curious about after kind of going through these, so that everybody has kind of an understanding of the the lineage that your photos in. What drew you to this? What is it that made you want to produce photos like this now? Um, I, I, the light, I'm not joking about the light. I'm truly not. Um, I, I saw it as that, and I thought that there has been a movement, which Stephen can speak to. I remember with Stephen marvelously, we were at a, I was in a show, and he was taking around a very august figure in the, in the photography world, and he was going through all the photographs, and he came to mine, and I overheard him say, now this is the most contemporary work in the show. And the man went, I guess, but it is contemporary in that this is something that's happening now of, of people going back and, and sort of reclaiming. Mm -hmm. And then the queer part of it too, of course, runs through all of it. Mm -hmm. And, and th these were all g gay men. I'm, the photographers were, who knows about the subjects. <laughs> um, but um, to revisit, and I hope, hope before you leave, you'll go back and look at the George Platt line, and all these pictures you should look at. This is very contemporary work here. The George Platt Lines is another person who's incredibly influential to me. Um, uh, his work looked of his time much more mm -hmm. than this did. He wasn't looking back, he was doing work at the moment. Yeah. But he did, he was, he also used mythology and his mythological pictures are pretty amazing. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I, I and I say this in the article I, that I find so interesting about this is that the 19th century Victorians both gave us our ideas of photography, but also our ideas of homosexuality. So these images are both creating for us our lineage of what it means to be a photographer, but also what it means to be a homosexual in a sort of European American based tradition. So I think there is really a natural connection between the two subjects. When I look at the photos, though, one of the things that really strikes me, that we talked about a little bit that I thought was kind of funny, uh, is the differences in the models uh, and some of the, the work you've had to do to sort of make the models look as period as the photos. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about your models, where you find them, the, the work that you do with them to get them ready for these. And um, Well, usually I find them, uh, you know, something as prosaic as model mayhem, <laughs> um, which is a, a model, you know, these are, I mean, they're not really professional models. They're sort of semi-professional. I can't afford the, the really good ones. <laughs> um, um, and they're starting out. And I just sort of look for a, a look. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, I have, I've been so surprised at how easily they sort of went into it without mm. me. And I didn't have to give any great backstory or whatnot. Because you've been to the studio. My studio, I, I, I neglected putting a picture of the studio as it is. You know, it's uh, a rather Victorian. It looks like it's like your grandmother's attic, sort of, you know. <laughs> and these kids come in there like, the first they say, see me, this 77-year-old guy. And then they look around like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it's all been cool. Everything's been good. I only fired one model. Um, and... Um, uh, uh, so it generally, yeah, it, it's a look that they have mm -hmm. that I think will work. And we, there's a lot of back and forth about, oh, please don't cut your hair. You know, please don't do this. Please don't do that. Because sometimes they just do because they're doing other gigs and those gigs want their hair cut. And so mm, sometimes it doesn't work. But um, I, I dress them um, sometimes, as Brian well knows, unfortunately, uh, only the nude ones sell. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> So all of my dressing up and making these things look this way, and I, some of my favorites are the dressed up ones, and I really love them. There, no one's buying them. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's the way it is. Um, so I use a lot of robes because the, the costumes are too expensive. Um, so I discovered robes, and that works rather well because you can sort of open up a robe a little bit, be a little peekaboo, and not mm -hmm. do that. Um, and um, I moved the I have some furniture and whatnot, and I changed the wallpaper occasionally. Mm -hmm. but. I was just really impressed by you talking about things that I hadn't thought about in terms of the changes in models, like uh, you don't see any tan lines in these older photos, right? And if you were to see one, it would really take you out of that effect. Forget about it. Uh, tattoos, piercings, circumcision, all of these things that to the modern eye wouldn't be all that impactful, but you see them in one of these historical photos and it would totally... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, I, I do look at that and they'll say, some tattoos, and this is what Photoshop is for, uh, a small tattoo is easy to take out. If they've got some 
honking big thing, then I can't hire them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, piercings, they can usually take them out. And again, Photoshop, you can do a little bit of that. Um, uh, and uh, yes, the circumcision is a problem. Yes, <laughs> because back then, men, men were not, and Americans tend to be. So that's a, that's a more delicate discussion I have to have with the models. <laughs> um, but it's better to have it before than during yeah. to get that out of the way. Um, do they ask a lot of questions? I'm, I'm curious. Do they ask you what the, the photos are going to look like, or do most of them just... I send them to the website. I want them to see what I'm doing. I don't want them... Because you know, to just... Sometimes I find these guys... Um, one of the ones in the article... Um, uh, <laughs> this guy was a... Um, this very... It's one of my favorites. Um, was a checkout clerk at Michael's, you know, art store. <laughs> and he just looked great and I said, would you model for me? And he said, I've only been in New York a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, you're good to be suspicious, good idea. <laughs> um, and, and, and I said, it is a closed, um, you're gonna be a closed model. And he came and he was just great. And he stayed totally dressed the whole time because he was some kid from Missouri. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have discussions. Um, and, um, yeah, shaving is another problem, shaving parts of the body. It's, it, gets, it gets quite amusing at times, actually. But um, it's, it's been a pretty good experience with them, actually. And some of them, yes, are curious, and they really want to talk about it. Others are just, here's your $200 and goodbye. And mm -hmm. that's... But they do have, you know, they did their job, and I'm not gonna, you know. Yeah. If they're interested, they'll ask, and then we'll talk about it. But. Yeah. One of the things that you that we talked about, um, which I unfortunately uh, have to come to getting uh, something wrong in the article, so I apologize to everyone. I've already discussed this with Stephen. I took too many photos of your photos and then tried to look at them later, uh, and thought that I was looking at a number of. Uh, uh, models who were people of color who were multiracial. Really, I just had very bad light settings on my camera. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about you know the people of color who show up yes. both in the historical photos and in your photos because right. this is the Victorian era. It is this really ethnographic, racist sort of like um, you know like uh, almost like uh, studies in sometimes not the photos we saw tonight, but in some of these Victorian oh. photographers, there's a real like uh, they're trying to show you the stages of man. Like oh, it's yeah. this yes, very... Uh, well, manifest destiny, you know, mm -hmm. pretty rampant. Um, so when I took this gentleman over here, yeah, I'll um, grab it. You said, uh, I said to him, um, I took out this print, which is, of course, is a, a cheetah print. So we, you know, maybe we're... And I said to him, would you be uncomfortable if I use this? Because I... And then I went to pictures, I went to back and I showed him pictures of, 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 of F. Holland Day. I'm saying, you know, back then, unfortunately, the way you would, would have been depicted very often would have been as some tribal kind of thing or, or whatever. And I don't, that's not my, that's not what I'm after. On the other hand, I am trying to be historically accurate. So I'm walking a very fine line here. I think this is something I want to do to put it in a historical context of the time. This was also before Black Lives Matter. <laughs> so maybe he'd be very different about it today. I don't know. Um, uh, I, there was one picture in, in them, another one of him, where he's just with a background, and that was fine. Um, but I had a discussion with him. But I, I, I am hiring in next week another uh, African American, uh, because I don't have enough, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I, I want to go there, but in you know, in, in a good way. And we've had he and I have been having discussions about it. Yeah, and one thing that I love about this photo, which I alluded to in the article, is, and and you and I spoke about this, is uh, the the posture, the the face, the expression, the way that the person is looking. All of these things in many of these actual Victorian photos. Uh, this person would have been uh, encouraged to, you know, make some kind of more snarling face, to be more looking down, to be less of this kind of like actual uh, model on an equal level with the other models. So it's one of the things that I think was interesting in your work. Right. Well, I also do say to them, I say, well, you know, back when these pictures would have been taken, were I using a view camera, I would be doing exposures of like 
10 seconds, 20 seconds. You have to hold still. People don't smile in Victorian photographs because they took so long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I said, I want to stare. And I generally told most of them, don't look at the camera. Look past me. The people didn't also tend to look at the camera. They looked, so I, I say, and I want you to have a very blank face. So I don't ask them to be animated. I ask them just to go calm. Um, so we get that. We get that. Actually, let's talk a little bit about your camera. What, how do you make these photos? What is it that you use and why, and how do you make those choices? Um, well, as, as you said in the article, I did start out being uh, authentic with a large format camera. That lasted about three days um, because it's so expensive to do them and such a pain in the ass to do them because you, you, know, you have these huge negatives and you're doing this. And the, the film now costs $7 a piece or more, $10 now, I think. So each sheet's $10 and to develop it is another $12. So $22 a shot, you know. And then, um, and one of the reasons I'm doing this, by the way, a, a shout out to Mr. Fraley in the back, is my students at School of Visual Arts. This whole alternative processing thing was brought mainly by students because we were making them sit in front of computers all day doing, because we, we went modern. Mm -hmm. And all the tactile part of photography was gone. Those of us who are photographers in this room, we love to get our hands covered with chemicals and all of that. And there was a, there was a physical aspect to it that's gone. And students have become interested and fortunately, Stephen, we had some ex-students of yours, um, of ours, who then became big in this, and they came back to teach. Mm -hmm. And I sort of snuck into the classes and sort of, you know, and, and listened. And then that's, that's, actually, I'm so glad you asked, because that's really the final thing that hit, was, oh, this is stuff I now know how to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before I would have maybe been trying to, if I tried to do this in Photoshop or something, it would just look not good. So we were doing this at the school, and I learned, and the person who taught me was one of my students. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Have they seen the uh, finished? Oh, uh, they helped me frame them. Mm. Um, and so we were together for a, a quite a few weeks. Because for the show that was here, everything was reframed with period frames. So it was a lot of work. Um, but it really helped the show to give it a, something. Anyway. And you said you're going to be shooting some more with a, a new model next week. Do you have plans to continue this uh, series indefinitely? What's your thoughts on this? I'm, I'm, I don't know. I would love to do a book. Yeah, and we, we'll, we'll, we'll end it almost with it because we don't want this to be too long. Um, there was this thing that I was doing, um, which is this, which you mentioned, uh, this invented photographer. This was going to be a found. When I think when Stephen was showing that gentleman around that gallery, I had put up this thing saying, this is a found portfolio of a Victorian photographer. We don't know who he is. You know, it, it was lost in the sands of time, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and people fell for it, which was great. Um, and I like that. And I do, I, the amount of reading I did on the Victorian period and what the poets were writing and all of that. When I had the show here, I did put up poetry by Whitman and, and, and um, writings by uh, Kafafe mm -hmm. and others. And it was a lo lot to do about hiding. And it's all about hiding. We have to hide who we are. And it's all about that. And back in those days, that's what it was. And so my fantasy is this is a man who was a commercial photographer who in a studio in Union Square took social lights and whatnot. But this is what he did for himself and to put under his bed, <laughs> as it were. Um, I would love to do work with a novelist, perhaps, and really make that story and really go into the history. Mm -hmm. Because it's, a, it's not missing from queer history. People like you are doing a very good <laughs> job of resurrecting. His book you know, is a lot of Whitman, a lot, a lot of Whitman in your book. Um, and, um, and I think your generation is interested in this, and younger queer uh, people are too. And there's not a lot out there, as you well know. Yeah. Um, and I, so I would love to really dig deeper in that sense on a narrative level mm. and make it that. I will say, as a historian, I am glad you did not go with the fully um, faux history project because when I was researching my first book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, I actually almost got tricked by an artist from the 90s 
who had created this group called the Coney Island Psychoanalytic Society. And she had imagined them as a group uh, when Freud only visited America you know, famously once. He was in New York once, and he went to Coney Island. There is one photo of a man from the back who might be Freud. No one's sure. It's the only proof. Um, but this woman artist created these films, which she attributed to a group that had met Freud when he came and did this Coney Island trip. And she made these surrealist early films called the Coney Island Psychoanalytic uh, Society. This is pretty good. Which then got picked up by a newspaper article. I think it was in the Times that referred to them as a real object. So when I was finishing up the book as I was doing like my final edits and everything I came across this and I was like oh my god there's these queer filmmakers inspired by Freud working in Coney Island in the 30s how did I miss them and then I finally hunted down one of the things I found like a, a version of it online and thankfully within like 10 seconds, I was like, this is not real footage. Exactly. This is not. But I really did fall for it for a moment. It was so well done. Uh, so I, I, just just personally, I am glad that you let us all in on the play. Well, and also, Brian, I, I wanted to, Brian does handle another artist who has a, has a, a, a gnome to, to whatever. Um, uh, um, and, but he's sort of very out about it. But I wanted to do that. But you know, Brian said, you know, it's really hard because who 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 do I introduce at the opening? You know, <laughs> there's nobody to introduce. You know, how do we? And then of course, and then my my partner as a lawyer says, uh, Curtis, you realize this is fraud. Um, <laughs> when you sell your first piece of art, this is fraud. You have said you're something you're not. not you know, just loosen up. But <laughs> uh, but but he wouldn't let me loosen up. And so for the two of them combined, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll come out and I'll be the guy. Um, but I really would like to, for the, if I did the book, I'd like to really, and we, would, we wouldn't say it was real. We would be upfront about that. Yeah. No, I, I think it would be, I think it would be wonderful. Yeah. So um, anybody know a, a, a good young novelist who would like to do something, let us know. If anyone is watching this later, please email. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Before we end, the last thing I want to ask you, uh, since we are in this space with so many wonderful photographers, uh, especially ones that have contributed to your own sort of growth as a photographer, can you say a little bit about George Platt Lines and Pajama and how it feels either to look at their work in reference to your own or to be showing in the same space well, with them? Yeah, well, Ian's work, um, it was great to be at the opening. It was this is like you know this was all of Brooklyn was here, mm -hmm. um, and young and when I was younger and um, you tend to when you're young you take pictures of your friends that's what you do, and um, there's a long history of that you know Nan Golden because it turned into a, you know, a very lucrative thing, um, and it's wonderful to see each generation doing it in their own way and then for him to go back to black and white and to also make them small. One of the things that's happened in photography is, you know, if it's big, it must be art, you know, mm -hmm. and then they're, they're doing everything large. And this is like, oh, yeah, I used to make photographs this size. And so I, there's a familiarity with it that I, I really liked. And, that, and then his friends were here and you saw them and, and a couple of people I knew who were teachers. Um, uh, so, and he, by the way, you look around at what's good about this, it's not just pictures of his young friends, they're older people, it's a nice mix. Um, George Pat Lyons has just always been uh, someone whose work, and again, he was a very well-known and influential fashion photographer, very successful, but his nudes were usually kept somewhat under the counter. I mean, in, other, in the queer community, gay men bought them and put them in their little collections, but I don't think he had, sh maybe Brian can correct me, I don't think he had shows of them. Maybe he did. I mean, the mythological ones where people are half naked, and I mean, it wasn't that he didn't show any nudes in shows, but they weren't just, some of them are just, you know, real nude nudes, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and I think also, just like my gentleman, by couching them in mythology, these wonderful, and he used a lot of airbrushing, um, which is something you don't do anymore, which is what Photoshop is, of course. But, you know, so he blended things together beautifully with, with art. He didn't do it, but he had an artist who helped him. Um, and by using mythology as a touchstone for a lot of his work, that I think made it more acceptable to people um, and made it, and the nudity became a little less about that, even though there's a lot of nudity in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
And yeah. I, he's just, I think he's extraordinary, was extraordinary as one of them. And he was the 40s and 50s, early 60s. Yeah. I have a, a, a much older friend who, who, jo- who knew them and, and joked that uh, it used to be that you hid your nudes away in the bedroom and you put your sort of frilly Victoriana out for everyone to see to symbolize that you were gay but not speak it. And he said, then the 70s came along and it all switched. Suddenly you put the dicks in the living room, but you hid the frilly things back in the bedroom. <laughs> and it's always stuck with me when I look at these, you know, what he chose to show and what he couldn't and what made it acceptable. Do you know, you put a sandal on someone and suddenly, well, now it's an illusion. Now they can be naked, you know. It, um, I was saying earlier, going back to the underwater series, which I did in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s, um, even mid 70s, going around to galleries then, this is, this is when things were blowing up, just mm-hmm. the, when the pictures were being reversed, I couldn't get shows because they said there wasn't enough dick yep. and the dicks <laughs> weren't hard because mine were still very romantic and they didn't want that, it was too romantic. Um, well, well now you have met the moment. <laughs> who knows, who knows. All right, well, let's... Yeah, uh, everyone enjoy the art now. Thank you all for coming tonight, yeah, and thank you. That is fun. Fun. Yeah. Thank you.